out because Bill wasn't quite sure. That. <laughs> Institute. My name is Deanna and it is very much my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. For those of you not familiar with Shumei, Shumei is a Japanese-based spiritual group. There are three tenets to the philosophy. Shumei strives to create health, happiness, and harmony for all through three tenets, the natural agriculture, healing jore, and fostering an appreciation of art and beauty. If you have any questions, please feel free to grab me if you want to array any of those things. Oh, and other housekeeping. This is not the only restroom. Feel free to walk back into our office and someone will help you find another restroom. So, Bill Sun. 17 years ago, Bill started this program. We are here today. So many community members have benefited from this program. It is, he gets it. He gets that art component to the Shumei philosophy. He gets it so much, he has donated his time for almost 20 years. He's been on our board, he's now on our advisory committee. He is very gracious with his time. I've had the opportunity to work closely with him for the last 11 years, which has been wonderful. The other thing that's really wonderful about having Bill here is because he has 50 years of being a professional photographer. I mean, <laughs> he has gone all over the globe teaching and photographing and really bringing it back to us. So thank you, Bill. Please help me welcome. Bill Elsie. Oh, shucks. <laughs> um, well, boy, this is the first time I've really looked out at an audience like this, and I think I know every single person. <laughs> uh, amazing. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Because my voice has gotten softer as I got older. And uh, so has everything else about me. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> so before I start uh, kind of a slideshow, um, I wanted to... Uh, say a little bit about my uh, earlier life um, and uh, where photography entered into it. Um, the family ranch in Texas has been a huge part of my, my life ever since I can remember. I was born in Missouri. My dad was a college professor at Stevens College in Columbia, uh, all-girls school that uh, about the time that I was old enough to take advantage of that, uh, <laughs> uh, I shipped off to the University of Denver. And I uh, was there for about a year and a half. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it, but it just wasn't working for me. So I dropped out and uh, <clears throat> actually got involved in the uh, civil rights movement. And uh, that was uh, 65, 1965. And I, uh, <clears throat> I told my mother, my dad was away at a speaking engagement, and I told my mother I was going to Selma and wanted to take the family car. <laughs> <laughs> he was in St. Louis, so we called him, and it was about 15 minutes before he was about to go on stage, and uh, poor guy, uh, <laughs> so he thought, 
thought about that, I'm sure, the whole time he was talking. Anyhow, he said, just wait till, uh, wait till I get back. I'm coming back tomorrow. So I waited. And uh, he had done some, uh, some legwork uh, in, uh, in St. Louis. And, uh, and when he came back, he said, I'm fine with you going. You can't take the family car. But I'd like you to go over and visit with a couple guys at, I believe it was Eden Seminary there uh, in Webster Groves. And uh, so I said, well, okay. And, uh, uh, you know, I just got so many stories. <laughs> and there's going to be some in the slideshow. Did y'all bring a pillow? <laughs> So, anyhow, uh, I went over and talked to those guys. They had been there. They, Dad thought it would be good if I talked to them. They'd been down there. So I visited with them. And turned out, they asked me at the end of this 45 minutes if I would represent Eden Seminary. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I. This is something I need to do for me, not for you guys. And uh, so, so by the time I got back to Columbia, Dad had found the Freedom Bus going. And it was run by, organized by Rabbi P. Montel. Not that you would know him, but uh, anyhow, he put it together said, why don't you take that bus? So I did. And um, <clears throat> um, I got there. That, that's a whole other story. <laughs> anyway, anyhow, and there were a number of marches in Selma. Um, not all of them uh, with Dr. King, but he happened to be there at the time I marched. So, uh, it was a great privilege and yeah. great thing to look back on. <clears throat> Anyhow, I came back and thought I was going to go into civil rights work. But first, I felt like I needed to make some money, and the Alaska pipe, uh, pipeline was being built. So I was going to go up and work on that with a high school buddy. And that was a time when you had to uh, uh, tell the Selective Service Board wherever you were going to be when you were my age. So my buddy and I went down to the Selective Service Bureau and the guy says, where are you going? I said, Alaska. He said, you got an address? And I said, we'll send it to you when we get there. <laughs> and he pulled out the file cabinet, LC, the very next folder. Eligible for the draft. Oh, my, my buddy's name was Fox, Randy Rodney Fox. E F. He's right behind me. Oh, so we looked at each other and we went to the, started seeing the recruiters, four branches. Visited with the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. And both of us picked the Air Force. We thought their educational uh, tech school trainings could be something we could use when we get back. Um, so we enlisted for four years, and that's where photography entered my life. There was a guy in my unit in tech school who showed slides one night of pictures he had taken earlier that day. And I said, mm, how do you do that? <laughs> My dad has to mail his in, and it's two weeks before we see his pictures. He said, well, there's a base hobby shop that has a dark room. I said, come on, I'll show you. So I went over, it runs rocket science. There was a bit of chemistry in cans and schools. And, um, and he said, I got this at the at the BX, the base exchange. It's a little Instamatic 500 camera. It's one of those that you buy a cartridge, 
plop it in. It just automatically advances. When you're done, it automatically rewinds. And when you're doing it yourself, you go in the dark room and you just break open the plastic housing, take it out, roll it onto a spoon, and go through the chemicals. So that was my introduction to photography. Um, I have only one picture from sort of that time in that camera. So I'm going to start with that. And because of uh, this uh, room configuration, I'm going to move this out of the way and pull this kind of over in the middle where everybody gets people uh, listening to throw tomatoes. It's the wrong season. So it's very loosely organized like that. 
And uh, not everything that you see necessarily took place in those places, but that's where I live when these things happen. So, well, this is my grandfather with Spotted Bird. And the newspaper wanted a, a picture of Spotted Bird. And he said, only if my friend Tom Elsley will stand there with me. So, um, the Kiowas used, used to come through our ranch uh, on their uh, migrations from the plains into the mountains. And, uh, and had befriended uh, my grandfather. Um, oftentimes when uh, the Indians came through, ranches would sometimes butcher a beef or two and, uh, and invite them. And I was telling somebody a story uh, in, the, in Texas about it. And he said, well, it's probably a good thing, or they would have put you their own. <laughs> so, and that could be, and that might be my grandfather you know, I have no idea. So, <clears throat> that's my dad, and he's all gussied up, probably for this professional photograph. <laughs> um, and on my mother's side, um, I know I have a picture of my uh, grandfather. On that side, my mother's from Vienna, Austria, and uh, and he, Papa, he called me, was a painter, and um, any anything that might be genetic in my art uh, makeup probably came from him, and I wish that I had been into photography and art while he was still alive, but uh, I wasn't. Mother thinks this is a self-portrait of him. It's, of course, in color. I'm not sure why it's black and white here. <clears throat> but, um, and it hangs in my house. And it's loosely called the tramp. <laughs> and to me, I don't know why I'm so emotional about all this. <laughs> To me, this is a rich man. Look at that appreciation for those flowers. That's what matters, you know. I mean, his sleeve is coming off his coat up here, and his nose and looks like a vinyl, you know, kind of red, bulbous, and, and, uh, pretty tacky. But it's my favorite of his pictures, uh, paintings, and boy, he's got a lot of them. And some huge and some anti-religious painted immaculately, almost fully realistic, and uh, of hope and the grandiosity of things and so on. And, uh, that's, again, another whole story. He uh, was also a photographer, and he photographed the bombing of Vienna wow. uh, when it was going on. And uh, <clears throat> all these paintings, of course, are in color, but these are kind of the archive version. Oh, <laughs> and that happens to be me. <laughs> yeah, I just noticed that it's 1946 down there on the bottom, and that made me one year old. So I started shooting early. <laughs> This is uh, this this picture uh, is, uh, is from this book, Panhandle Cowboy. This picture, and, and when I found this, I wanted to put an early picture in where, where my hair wasn't all white. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to read you a little bit of what John Erickson. John Erickson. Uh, well, you'll see in a minute. Um, uh, by the way, when I got out of the service, I went back to Texas Tech University. And uh, in order to take advantage of my electronics training, 
I enrolled in electrical engineering and, uh, and found that, uh, no offense to electrical engineers, very dry. <laughs> My taste. So, uh, so when a big blizzard hit the ranch, um, it mixed cattle from ranches all around. And I drove my Jeep up there to help sort cattle. And I've always loved that life before I, well, all my up, upbringing days. I was riding and working cattle down there at the ranch. And, uh, and even uh, made college money driving tractors for a couple of acres up on the flats, wheat farmers. So, um, so I, uh, I went up to help sort cattle, and the work was so satisfying, I never went back. And I didn't tell anybody uh, that I was staying or what. And you know what? Nobody ever noticed. I <laughs> never got anything from the school saying, uh, you see, you've missed, you know, like a month of classes or something. So, um, so I knew that's where I was supposed to be. Anyway, this is uh, John Erickson. Well, you'll see here. He says, Bill Elsie was the first man to draw. I, I'm taking this privilege to read something because I saw Patrick Moore's uh, art symbols. He read from his own. Uh, <laughs> Law, what do you call those? Journal. Dire journal. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Elsie was the first man to draw wages on the Crown Ranch, and he was managing a ranch up in the Oklahoma Panhandle. Uh, on the Crown Ranch while I was there. I met him in August 1971 when my wife Chris and I visited the Lawrence Elsie family <clears throat> at their ranch on Wolf Creek, southeast of Perryton, Texas. After spending the afternoon riding horses around the ranch, we returned to the house. As I walked in the back door, I saw a bearded young man with black hair and a tanned face. Mrs. LZ introduced me to her nephew, Bill, who had been working on the ranch for six months. In February, a bad blizzard had struck the panhandle, and Bill, an engineering student at Texas Tech, oops, uh, had driven up to Perryton to help his Uncle Lawrence <coughs> gather up his cattle. <coughs> My Uncle Lawrence was uh, number two son of four sons, <coughs> my dad being the oldest. And he, uh, the three other brothers, um, uh, had him manage their parts of the ranch as well. Uh, <coughs> The work had appealed to him and he had remained on the ranch living in an old hired hand's house along the banks of Wolf Creek. I liked Bill the minute I met him. He had an easygoing manner and in his eyes I could see intelligence, wit, and curiosity. <laughs> That's all I was really going to read this for. <laughs> Actually, I think curiosity is about the only thing left out of him. He was a cowboy who wanted to become a professional outdoor photographer, and I was a cowboy who hoped to become a professional writer, and we have a lot to talk about. And it goes on. So, um, so um, next slide. While I worked on the ranch, uh, I carried a camera and either in the pickup or on my Saturday, much of the time, not all the time, but this was one morning. And some of these pictures have become kind of iconic for my personal uh, <coughs> time working on it. I call this one a cold meal. <laughs> And here I was feeding the middle pastures. The pastures are sections, uh, full sections of land. 
square miles, and uh, I call this seven bulls. And they were, the bulls are separated from the cows so that they breed them at the time where the calves drop when it's not the dead of winter. Um, this is uh, Marv Mattis, Marv Mattis' favorite picture. <coughs> and this one, <coughs> this is where I thought the long stories would begin. I've got about three photographs, maybe three and a half, that have kind of, uh, shall we say, little longer stories than the stories that go with the others. But every story has a, has a every photograph has a story. Anyway, and this is a photograph that I set up. Some people don't like to hear that. Some people like it better. But I'd been in a Western art show with uh, Western art uh, painters and sculptors, and I was driving home thinking these guys are so lucky, like my grandfather and my mother's father, to be able to paint anything in their mind. And I, I'd always had in the back of my mind that hopefully running across a calf rescue. <clears throat> and I thought, by golly, why can't I do that too? So, um, as you see, it's winter, and I, I got kind of excited about the idea, and I, before even going home, I drove up into the pasture where I knew that there was one wooden windmill tower left on our place. They uh, get old, they, uh, after a while, they tear them down and replace them with steel towers that have no soul. <laughs> so, and I knew this draw from working in that pasture many, many times. Went up there sort of close to it. So I drove up there to see how close. Boy, this could work. <clears throat> I'm in my car, and this is the pickup that I drove up. Went down. My cousins were, uh, you know, had the feet up by the fire in the, uh, in the upper section of the house. And I, my enthusiasm must have been stellar because I talked them in <laughs> to going out in this weather, saddling up a couple horses. There was a sick cow in the lot who had a calf. Of bringing the calf along, jumping them in the trailer, going up there. So, as soon as we got there, I went over and I set up the tripod and the camera where I was going to put them. And I, uh, these are my cousins, Tom and John. Tom is lifting the calf and John is above and then Stormy and Rusty, the horses. And uh, full credits. <laughs> So, when I got him about where I wanted him to be, uh, John was uh, crouched in front of the horse he's closest to there. And I said, John, take a, go about two feet to your left. And uh, that looked good. And I went back and I had a cable release on the camera, clicked it, nothing. Camera froze. Uh, it was about 15 degrees. So I told the truth. I said, the shutter's frozen. I'm going to run back to the pickup, hold it in the dash, turn on the heater, see if we can get it going, which is exactly what I did. So Tom, in the meantime, had taken his jacket off and put it around the cabin. And just, just held it there. And they, well, anyway, it, uh, uh, when I could, finally make it shoot, I uh, knocked off a couple frames and this was uh, this was a camera you had to crank to wide. It's a 120 film if for a you know. Um, and uh, cranked off a couple of frames, came back and put it on the, <coughs> the tripod and uh, uh, and there, there's only 12 exposures to a roll of that 120 film. And so I shot about a roll and a half. And, uh, 
But while I was working up the camera, it started snowing. And it was just the thing that dusted the hats and dusted the manes, the ropes of the horses. It just added that. It kind of hazed out the windmill a little bit. Uh, and it was Providence. <laughs> So this is, was kind of a, again, a seminal uh, image uh, for me there. I made some greeting cards out of it, and uh, oh, my greeting cards go about that far. Um, so, well, my dad, at one point, who had introduced me when I was about 30, 35, introduced me as his retired son. <laughs> Said, son, son, maybe if you think this photography thing is something you're going to do, maybe you want to photograph some people. You might have better luck than selling cows and horses. And so sometime around that time, this book came into my possession. Yusuf Karsh, famous Canadian photographer, all black and white, photographs, heads of state, uh, actresses, artists. Um, this is one of his most famous ones. And I just devoured this book. I just loved it. And wanted to emulate it. So um, there was a guy about to go in the Navy and get all his hair cut off and live back in town. I said, why don't you come down? I got a new uh, flash reflector. And I wanted to try it out. So I came down and I made this. And uh, I've been working um, on this uh, photography habit um, for quite a while that I was beginning to want to speak photography to somebody. And I asked the portrait photographer in town if there's a club or anything going on. Uh, he said, Well, why don't you come to Amarillo with me? Uh, for the next uh, Panhandle Professional Photographers Association meeting. And so I went, and there were my people, except they were all portrait and wedding uh, and commercial photographers, but we talked about the same language. So uh, this actually won a, a first prize at Best of Show on one of their competitions. This, not flash, is just window light. Um, but with what I learned going to these, I would, I would learn a lot at these things, even though that wasn't my subject matter, and uh, about light and seeing light and making light happen uh, in the right ways. Uh, case in point, <clears throat> this was a couple I started doing outdoor portraiture. and. Uh, even though you can see more light on one side of their face than the other, it's because where I stood them in the, the woods. Uh, you could look up and there was kind of an opening in the uh, leaves that became the main light. It's very soft, very gentle light. But my heart is with landscape photography. <coughs> This is what I made through the window one night when the storm banging through and uh, woke me up. And all this stuff, by the way, is film, uh, not digital. I'll tell you when we change over. And it's actually when we get to the Crestone era. Uh -huh. <clears throat> uh, but what made this unique was, and it, by the way, when it's pitch dark, it's easy to photograph lightning. You just look where lightning's happening, start the camera, open it up, and there's light for lightning paint itself on the floor. So that's what I did. But you, then you advance the film and you do it again. And you advance the film and do it again and again and again. <coughs> this is one that came back. Surprise. Probably. Yeah. <coughs> so, I love the 
it's ground to cloud lightning. So the branching kind of echoed the bare branches down in the lower left. <coughs> all this prairie skyline makes me think of all the city skylines up there. Uh, but it's the wide open spaces. This is another one that has a little bit longer story like the calf rescue. <clears throat> a, uh, an oil man, a wildcatter, had uh, seen some of my landscape pictures at a bank uh, in the Panhandle, uh, uh, Texas Panhandle, just south of the Oklahoma border. And uh, he was from Kansas. And he asked me, called me one day, and he said, I wonder if you'd take a picture of my drilling rigs. And I said, well, probably. Uh, let's talk. And uh, uh, he said, and I did. I did some, you know, beauty pictures, you know, sunset, all this. You know, as beautiful as you could make a drilling rig. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> and then he said, uh, one time, I'm going to be moving from one location and setting up on another. I wonder if you would photograph that entire day from start to finish. And I said, sure. It became a 16-hour day. And this is the very last photograph. They uh, <coughs> uh, were putting it all together. That takes a bit of time. They started while it was still dusky. And uh, I was over there shooting the breeze with the guys, and, uh, and I asked the driller, I said, do you guys, uh, do you guys ever light these things while you're bringing them up, or do you wait until they're up? He said, oh, we can. You want me to? I said, sure. <laughs> so I had this idea in mind of this time exposure. So I went off a ways, <coughs> set up a tripod and camera, frame it all up. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the rig is down now. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, hmm, I wonder if that's going to go out of the top of the frame by the time it gets all the way up. So I took the camera and I held it vertical. From about where that car is with the red tail lights up to the end of the tower. And it fits. So, put it up, waited. And uh, so I'm standing there watching for it to start, start moving. And it was moving very slowly and I didn't notice that it had already started until it was the first place you see the uh, sort of the turquoise color. So, open the shutter. <coughs> and uh, it's uh, it's going up, and I'm watching, and I thought, this is going just as planned, and it stops. <laughs> and I go, whoop! It, this is a camera, if you close the shutter, uh, you have to advance the film to the machine again. <coughs> so I thought, oh, my. That's not exactly what I said. But, uh, <laughs> I, I put my hat off, and I put it in front of the camera. And, it was pitch dark, so there's no reflection coming off my hat <coughs> to the camera. And so it started moving again. I put the hat back on. It stopped again. <laughs> <laughs> Got all the way up. Stopped. Right there on that spot, I invented the Stetson shutter. <laughs> <laughs> and this became my very first magazine cover. Oh. It's just huge. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> a friend sent me a flyer for a photo workshop in Tony Wright. And uh, I was so smitten with it, I uh, ended up uh, buying uh, the contents of a dark room and renting the guy's space. <coughs> And this uh, woman was coming through from the Denver Post, <clears throat> and uh, I don't know where she got my name or what, but she wanted to interview me, and she took these pictures <clears throat> and used some of mine. So this is a 
little office that adjoined my dark room, uh, which is here, and which is where I live. <coughs> and there was a loft where I slept. And, uh, and I've got three enlargers uh, lined up there. Let's see, on the left side, you can't really see. Anyway, and it was right above the Nugget Theater. And through the floor register every night, I could smell popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I bought this dark room, um, they, uh, there was a, a film spooled tank, stainless steel tank. It turned out to be a little longer than the ones I were using, was used out at the ranch. And uh, so when I was agitating the film, the, uh, the spools were traveling more distance in the developer. And it was overdeveloping the edges of the film. There was some turbulence around the uh, room of the spools. So I thought, oh boy, you know, I really like the shot, but it's very difficult. One of the gradation is that gentle to Growing it in or dodge it in this case without it being apparent. So I thought, well, why don't I just vignette it completely out and the top and the bottom as well and call it winter vignette? <laughs> <coughs> and this picture has been used for national, national ag advertising for the ski company. I made uh, greeting cards once again. I didn't realize that they went that far back. Um, that far back in my history. Um, but um, that's the case for an accident. In many walks of life, some accident uh, creates like a uh, polio vaccine. Or <laughs> like that. Wow. <laughs> Torchlight Parade. Uh, people are familiar with ski areas and skiing. Uh, every now and then, that ski company, just for fun, uh, uh, gets a bunch of skiers who want to do this and with uh, like highway flares, safety flares. <coughs> and uh, there didn't have to be very many of them. There might have been, I don't know, 15 or 20 in this bunch. And, uh, I had shot this in black and white once and really liked the shot. Uh, black and white film. And I thought, well, I want to do a color version of it. So I went up, set it all up, um, and when I first started seeing them moving up there, I opened the shutter and just waited, waited, waited. And this again is film. Uh, so, like the uh, drilling rig, you don't know if you're just going to blow out the, uh, the frame, the, the, the transparency. Um, but, you know, you kind of say, well, F11. Uh, F16. Uh, hold back as much as, as long as you can and still record the light on the, uh, on the film. So this is about a 25 minute exposure. Wow. But because of that black and white image, <clears throat> there was the upper left quadrant was kind of dark. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat if there were some fireworks in there? Well, about that time, the firemen started shooting fireworks off down in the town park. <laughs> so by this time, I had to have a hustle block. I told the guy, fellow professional photographer and I was thinking about buying the house block and he said, oh, I think I'd rather have an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> That's how silly they were. So I thought, well, you know, so I just turn the camera back that, or down that way and you can take the film back off, cock the shutter, put the film back back on. Another wonderful thing about the house. Put it back on. Now looking through the lens, 
and there's street lights going through the bottom of the frame. And I thought, well, oh my God. But, uh, and then I, I took the camera up about 45 degrees, which the, the street lights were all below that visibility. And I thought, well, so long as the fireworks go somewhat down or off to the side or whatever, I'll get away with this. Mm. And did. Mm -hmm. but I was exposing that same piece of film with this. And it was toward the end of the fireworks display. And I'm sitting there with the shutter open saying, let's have a few more, fellas. <laughs> also knowing that I could be really overexposing this, and it's a wonderful <coughs> deal. Finally, I chickened out. And just got it with this one. When the film came back from processing. <laughs> Providence again. <laughs> okay. The uh, marketing director of the ski company, a uh, woman who had kind of been in the ski industry for a long time, called me one day and said, Would you be interested in leading a photo workshop in Egypt? <laughs> you, you saw my little office in that. <laughs> so there. I said, Pam, that's absolutely the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> well, and she said, well, I'll set it all up. You just have to do it. So <clears throat> I said, okay. So she put together a trip, <clears throat> and we were in New York, <clears throat> waiting to, uh, <clears throat> to, to go. And I was walking down the street, and I looked in a travel agency door, and on the wall there was a black and white, I can swear it was a black and white photograph of the Sphinx and Pyramid lined up just right on it. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder if you can actually stand in a place like that where they line up. This was pre-Photoshop days. And uh, so when we got over there, we got settled in and we wandered around and <coughs> wandered out to uh, to the, uh, this area, and I saw that finally there is a place that this can happen, but you got to climb over this rock wall and go out in the field. And there's an art and light show that goes on um, there, uh, I think every night, in a different language, you know, French, German, whatever, uh, for the tourists. And, um, so we uh, bought tickets for it, and I took my camera, <clears throat> and it happens about dusk, um, and it's narrated by in the English. It was Vincent Price. <laughs> I don't know if I would say that to a crowd any younger than this. <laughs>
close to the timeline. <coughs> and uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, what's going to make my picture look any different from everybody else's here? I was kind of looking around, and I looked back, and the moon, the full moon, was rising. And I always take uh, the finer screen out of my cameras and replace it with one that has kind of a grid on it, just for situations like this, where I can frame it up and say, okay, where this crosses, or right about here, is where I want the full moon. I'm going to take a picture. <coughs> and then double expose whatever else into it where that will be there. And uh, <clears throat> so I did that. Again, we're talking film. You can't really see what you're getting. And when you're shooting film, you often bracket the exposures. You shoot one a little too dark, one like right on what the meter says, a little too bright, in order to ensure, ensure that you get uh, a Exposure. So I actually did this several times, and, uh, and it was kind of uh, interesting because, well, let me show you the picture. Uh, <laughs> so the, the Sphinx and Pyramid I was framing up with a 80 to 200 zoom lens, and the moon I was shooting with a 300, so I had to take the lens off. So. All these other guys here. I make this picture. Back off the page 200, below the 300. <laughs> and I would hand hold the moon because uh, the moon is essentially uh, the same distance from the sun as the Earth. So that's, there's a sunny 16 rule that tells you what your exposure should be. <coughs> uh, give it to you because 90% of you won't know about it. It's about, but anyway, <coughs> so I can hand hold it and have a fast enough shutter speed that it wouldn't be. And I did that several times. And again, when the film came back from the developer, whoa. Well, so I think it's a beautiful picture. Well, um, one day, years later, uh, a National Geographic photo editor was coming through Colorado. And uh, I had some friends in oh, Photographers Aspen. There were four guys who were all National Geographic photographers. And uh, one of them was at the very first photo workshop that I went to in uh, Telluride. And we became great fast friends. And, uh, and they told this woman, you should go over to Telluride and look through Elsie's stuff. And she did. And she went through all my files, file cabinets of pictures, made some notes. And then Sometime, I don't know how long later, I got a call from her uh, saying, I wonder if you would send us this picture. And I said, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so they used it. And they used it in a book, uh, one of those special publications that's over there on that table. Uh, it's about a page and a half spread. And, uh, uh, and then I got a call from the uh, secretary of the publisher saying, I wonder if you could document this picture for us. I said, absolutely. Um, she said um, that there's not a problem here, really. But um, the, the publisher at the time was Gil Grosner. And he said he has a friend who uh, just loves Boston Geographic uh, for any little thing. Uh, and we, he just asked you know, what the documentation was for this. And, and I told him at the very beginning, the outset, you know, that this is an in-camera double exposure. 
So uh, no hanky panky. Uh, and again, at that time, Lightman, I think, was just beginning to hear rumors about. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so I said, <laughs> I, I can do that. My brother-in-law was a senior astronomer at the planetarium in Chicago. So I called her. I said, this is what's afoot, Eric. Can you tell me? Oh, the guy was saying the moon could not be in that position. <laughs> and I said, can you? And I sent him the picture. And he said, can you uh, verify that the moon can or can't be in that position? And he said, sure. So, you know, he has aerial photographs, you know, north, south, uh, all this data. And a few days later, he uh, calls me. He said, you yeah, know, not only can it be there, it can be for, uh, out of the frame, further to the left, it can be behind the pyramid, and it can be off to the right side, which is where it was in the daytime when we were there in the dusk periods. Um, and I said to Eric, well, I bet, I bet the moon's upside down, though. And he said, he said, no, it's rotated 30 degrees. <laughs> and I thought, boy, this is a pretty thorough uh, report that I can give to those guys. And I said, a lot of people said, oh, I think you realize if it was going to be correct, I would shoot it here, and then the camera would have to go like this. And I said, why the 30 degrees? He says, because the moon doesn't go like this. It goes like this. So, there's that. <laughs> so then, they, um, they, they paid me for the use of it for that book. And they paid me for the use of it for this poster that they sent to 20,000 schools uh, wow. throughout the country for National Geography Awareness Week. Huh? I don't know if you can read that fine print. But it even has a photograph right there. And in fact, it's laying on this table over here. So when you get your hands full of cheese and crackers, go to work. <laughs> seven times when I got paid for it. Um, uh, film strip, um, an in, in-house, uh, like seven foot uh, in-house mural, uh, a number of times. And each time I got paid for it, which was great. <coughs> so, personnel changes hands, and, uh, nobody knows about the picture anymore. Fifteen years later, I'm building my strong house down here, and I've got a funnel of facts, and it goes, you can barely read it, you know, it's that, uh, I'm reading it, it's from National Geographic. We're considering using your Sphinx of your picture for the cover of the magazine. What? It's so nice, pull my chain. Uh, so I called my uh, geographic buddy over and asked him, I said, what about this? What do you think? And he said, well, it's kind of unlikely because usually a cover picture is taken from an uh, entire story in the, in the magazine. And I said, well, yeah, you're probably right. So I didn't reply to it for like three days. But it was just kind of itch, you know. So I replied, and they said, yeah, we, uh, we'd like to use it. And they called me, and uh, the guy says, and the moon, is that a single exposure? And I said, no, it's an in-camera double. And I also know 
that publications don't like to reuse things that have been published either by other magazines or even maybe by their own magazine. It was all I could do to not say, well, you used it seven times before. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't say anything. There's a long pause on the phone and the guy said, well, if the moon wasn't there, is it a straight shot? Yeah, that was one of the exposures. And he said, okay, uh, we'll get back to you. Time went by, didn't think much about it anymore, thought that it's not going to happen. And then they said, we're using it in a simply big check. <laughs> biggest check that I had seen up to that time. <laughs> well, um, and they didn't even have to Photoshop the moon out of it. Um, but I think they would have put it in had not there been a, uh, a big brouhaha mm -hmm. over the exact same subject, Sphinx or the pyramids, where Geographic itself, when Photoshop became kind of uh, common, had moved pyramids for a cover shot for better composition. Mm -hmm. Photographers who had been there, who may even live there, they would say, oh, 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 mm -hmm. nobody can stand and get a picture like that. And National Geographic had to own up to it. They had egg on their face because they pride themselves in accuracy. These magazines are used in school libraries as resource material because they're traditionally so accurate. But they owned up to it. Um, this, this same photographer, David Heiser, um, one time I was visiting with him over in his uh, living room in Aspen, and he was real excited about an assignment he had coming up for National Geographic Special Publications for one of the book chapters. And I think that book is over there too. And I think it's called something like America's Hidden Corners or something. It's a big stack over right there. <clears throat> but it was on the border of uh, Mexico and Guatemala in the state of Chiapas. And uh, he was so, he said, and he's had like 50 National Geographic stories. And he said, you know, I'm about as excited. He's, he's very unexpressive. I mean, you know, not. And he says, but, you know, I, I'm about as excited about this one as I have been about any of these. In about that tone of voice. <laughs> and, uh, that was like, hmm. And I thought, boy, I'd like to go. Uh, I'd like to go to. So I went home and thought about it. I said, David, what if I went along uh, and did a story on how a National Geographic photographer handles an assignment? <laughs> and he said, oh, I don't know. Let me run it by Geographic. So he got back to me and he says, uh, well, they say you can go, but you got to pay your own expenses. Good enough. Um, so we went, um, and uh, I don't speak Spanish. He speaks a little bit. And uh, we got separated at the, at the airport because uh, they pulled him aside. I don't know if you've seen these uh, big uh, kind of cake looking things that are like real hard cracked plastic where they ship like dates over from Greece to the US. And they have a, have a lid like this that, you know, and it's waterproof. And he has all his camera gear in there. Uh, but he's gone for a while and we'll... <laughs> and he shows up, he said, I forget what you, what you call that thing, but he said it was that. I said, why? He says, that's what people smuggle bull semen into the U.S. So anyway, this is the, this is the uh, assignment that I tagged myself on 
to. And, and in the end, um, I, uh, they paid for my way because I pulled my way. And, um, and the high center of the truck, uh, the mud quagmire one night, and, uh, and from the ranch experience, you know, I just slithered it under there, you know, and was able to kick the rock out of the way and slither it back out and things like that. Anyway, David said, you know, hey, we should cover these guys. Expensive. And they did. Anyway, this uh, this is one of the dugouts uh, with a uh, uh, motor on the back, obviously. And uh, to go up these travertine waterfalls, they had to hit it at enough speed to get that much weight. That's a, that's a tree car, car now, not to mention all our supplies and everything. So I took a run at it. And in the travertine waterfalls, you can kind of see a, 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 a break in the actual uh, limestone that wide enough to get that through. That's a big splash. And, uh, <laughs> and David told me when I get back to the States, he said, look, do a, do a tight edit on your photographs and send them in and I'll send them in with mine. This became the lead photo. <laughs> in that. So, and a couple others of mine. So there, up over there. Um, I did a I did an aerial photo book. I was one of four photographers who did an aerial photo book on the state of Texas uh, for this uh, an Australian uh, publishing company. And um, uh, again, I'm sitting in that little office you saw in that picture. It's a call comes from Australia. And I uh, said, would you be interested in working on a Texas book from the air? And I said, oh, yeah, I think so. I used to live in Texas. Um, so uh, <clears throat> made the, all the, uh, you know, it all was going to work out. And, <clears throat> um, and I did, and uh, they didn't exactly, I, I think they might have given me a credit card because I had to, to rent airplanes and helicopters and stuff. And, for the first time in my life, I had to make bookings to these guys, you know, to uh, reserve the plane for like half hour before sunrise, and, you know, and make sure somebody is checked out for <coughs> night flying, you know, for going out and being away from these airports, you know, and, and time to get nice sunset stuff, and maybe be dark by the time to get back. Anyway, did that, and it worked out really well. And uh, so they call me for this. Remember the Day in the Life books? It's a whole series, a day in the life of these different countries. Uh, and uh, well, this is the same publisher for those Day in the Life series. And this time they hired 20 photographers to uh, uh, go into Western Australia for 10 days. The day of the life were one day. 200 photographers go out for one day and that would uh, be what they would edit into a book like this. So, um, so I went, did it, got a great area of Western Australia. The book was to be for sale during the America's Cup race where I believe Australia was defending <clears throat> so that was the marketing idea. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> lo and behold, this this photograph of mine made the cover, the rat round cover. Right? And uh, this is one of the, uh, there's, like I say, what did I say, 20 photographers. Yeah. Uh, so just work from them. We each had an assignment area that we went and worked in. And, uh, but this was a particular interest to me is Shell Beach. It, not a grain of sand on this beach, as far as you can see. It's all these shells, about as big as my fingernail. Uh, you can see in the cupped hands picture there. And then uh, 
Monte Maya, where uh, this woman uh, befriended the uh, uh, dolphins to come in, and it became quite a tourist attraction. Now, the people there are just like shoulder to shoulder for a long, long way. Um, this, uh, this is made down there in Australia, and uh, um, I had to, uh, there's, I wanted the top of the boat to separate visually from this bit of land back there. Um, but I couldn't stand, do it for standing on the ground, so I climbed up on a picnic table. That didn't quite do it either. So there was a cooler uh, there that I put on top of that and got on top of the cooler. And it was so close that I found another cooler. <laughs> and I could get that little bit of separation. These people were coming from that boat. They just anchored it. <coughs> Jillian was, and I were talking about this this thing, and she was saying, man, you know, photography is just taking you all over the world. And it had, no, not all over. There's a lot more places I want to go than where I've been. Um, but um, India, of course, Taj Mahal. Um, yeah, this is from the hotel room window. Just happenstance and look out there and I'm like, don't go away. And why I picked the pictures I picked for this show, I have no idea, but I've got so many that say India. I mean, this could be a hard <coughs> canvas. But this is a broken out window, and uh, kind of the trick here is to wait for all three pigeons to get in profile. <laughs> <laughs> and also, where the plaster is kind of missing at the top, looks like a little rubber ducky. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mountain background and sunlight coming. In beside the mountain that's out of the frame, there's some rim lights on this Langur monkey. Cristo era, finally. <coughs> Ta da! <laughs> that's the way I felt looking out the window. Uh, it was when my studio was in the house. It was BJ before Jillian. And, uh, <laughs> and I was just working at the computer and I looked out the window. Double take, grab the camera. This with a 12 millimeter lens. That's right. It's like the edge one. This, this top cloud went, came back over the house. Wow. That's how wide it is. <coughs> and it's got our crest on. Uh, Challenger, Pete Carson, Crystal B. Okay. Um, this is the half story. Uh, uh, three and a half stories, I think. That would going to be kind of longish. Actually, I hadn't intended to talk about everything in this detail. So anyway, it'll pick up. It'll pick up. This guy, um, Greg Griffin, uh, was going to get married. He used to live here, um, and uh, he and Pat Dunlap were going to get married. And he called me one day or something on the street, and he said, Bill, I'd like you to photograph my wedding. And I said, Craig, I hung that hat up on a peg long ago. I don't do that. So it's going to be an argument. <laughs> uh, it will take your girlfriend. Why do you think I'm going to put that hat back on? <laughs> well, uh, my girlfriend was Jillian. She's still my girlfriend. <laughs> 
No. Um, so anyway, we went. And um, I, I usually show these in uh, kind of reverse order. And because uh, this was my first trip with a digital camera. And I had, I had just got it before this. It's one of those, you hear photographers tell these stories of, you know, I was reading the manual on the airplane when I was going over, you know, whatever. And that's exactly what I was doing. So it was that fresh to me. And um, so I had the camera set for certain um, uh, exposure. And, um, and when I got back to the room and looked at it, this is what it looked like. This, of all the photographs, this is the one I was looking forward to the most. So I thought, there it is, just room. Put it in the computer and started with the software, that little slider. And that's when it became that. Okay, this is what sold me on digital. <laughs> it's because you can kind of mine, mine the dark areas for, for detail. Made a nice little uh, Getting out of yoga one night, uh, joined Connington's class, driving home, and I said, oh my god, I'll <laughs> be there when I get home. <laughs> and, uh, and it was not only there when I got home, I shot like 98 frames. <laughs> um, I just went in the house, got a chair, put it out here, and a little book. Because clouds are moving so much, but as you're watching them, it doesn't look like they're moving that much. Uh, so I knew I had to kind of look away, make my health look away for a fresh look and see if it's changed enough to take another picture. So anyway, I spent a lot of time with that. So first light done at the sand dunes um, and how you can use to isolate, or you can use it to isolate subjects. S-curves are favorites of photographers, and I think you can get away with reverse s curves too. Now this, uh, this is a little four series thing here. This is the ranch up in the northern part of the valley. And I just love the way the, uh, the white, uh, and not only that, but the, uh, where the oak brush goes in and makes those kind of fingerprints on, mm -hmm. on the wall and the other little drainages. And I love it. So I actually shot this series for uh, a teaching thing um, of what you keep out of the picture and what you keep in it and how it changes your impression of the picture. So I widen up a little bit. I include some of the, some of the snow at the top. And you know what you're feeling about the picture and that. And then here, completely the top of the mountains as well, against kind of a gray sky. And then, and I still have those three in, in there at the top, those three drainages with snow. And then, when you go wider, um, how it becomes more a uh, snapshot, I guess. Say because there's now there's so many more things to look at. You, you got blue sky, not just gray cloud, but blue sky, gray cloud, snowpack on the top, uh, and all this. And uh, uh, so, um, how you uh, how you look at things? Um, this this picture uh, again. I took for a teaching picture because um, can anybody maybe offer an idea why I took this picture? Awesome lines. Light, that's a few. Different lines. The tree there. Different colors of light. Well, I'll tell you. Okay, uh, a painter, uh, they 
difference in the warmth and coldness of the color. But why I took it was, <clears throat> look at the side of the trees in the foreground that the light is on in the shadow, uh -huh. and look at the light and shadow side yeah. of the trees in the background. You go, Ooh, how does that happen? Well, the background is catching direct light from the sun. The ones in the foreground are catching reflected light off of a close hillside on the right. But that's the kind of stuff after you keep doing this darn thing in photography, you know, you gotta be attuned to is um, things like that. It's an excellent teaching slide. Uh, just a walk down uh, Two Trees Road one morning. Uh, when, you, uh, when you've got something really great going on in front of you, don't forget to turn around and look behind you. This is uh, over at Lito and Linda's house. Uh, and you can see through the window at the couch and the base and the stuff and, the, and their little uh, silhouette of the hawk to keep birds from flying. Um, I got a feeling I've been talking a long time. It's 4.30. That's about 10 minutes before the championship NFL game. <laughs> Maybe we better stop. <laughs> or, or. Um, well, um, I said I was going to kind of race through the ones at the end. And let me just do that. Uh, and if anybody needs to go, uh, please, I, I will not be offended, offended. I, I'm amazed you've stayed this long. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Japan, boy, yeah, I just, uh, I, I just love reflections. This is this is really uh, a very popular picture. I love it. Uh, it's so clean. You know, it's just two things to look at: leaves and white trunk. I think that this is on Monarch Pass. This probably made the film that long ago. Light. Light skimming on the side of the horse. Tortoise <coughs> Delpine, yeah, Patagonia. This is a shutter speed shot, having the shutter speed fast enough to not have the river become white on the white caps, just yeah. racing through, and slow enough to blur. And I like creating a question in people's mind, is that clouds or is that uh, it kind of does it there. This is a uh, kind of a close-up of uh, beach logs on the Pacific coast that just get hammered by the surf into the stones and worn down. And they make the most incredible, I just backed up one there, most incredible Besides, I mean, who knew all that's going on inside a tree? Uh, okay, this was a, a, a stone place, uh, as you can see, out in Boulder at my last workshop. I threw this one in for Father Eric. <laughs> <laughs> He's my younger father. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, this is uh, 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 somebody help me. Uh, uh, no. No. I'm good. I'm good. It's not that well known. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you can camp out in there. And uh Arches. 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 No. Oh, Zaya. Page. <laughs> See, it's unknown. Uh, yeah. I've never been there, but yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it didn't work so there. 
Thank you all. I just want to say one thing. I'm sure you would know this, but it's been well over a hundred times. There's something going on, and I look at it and I say, I wonder if Bill's seeing this. <laughs> you know, that's the biggest compliment anybody can make. Because uh, I hope that what I do makes people delicious. Uh, and, and I have a neighbor who says, oh, I should have called you. And I said, call me. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's that good. Uh, so I, I uh, well, let's see how I have from three to five. Yeah, yeah, we want to see the second half. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for your perseverance. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to say, but thankfully I got some notes in the picture for uh, So, uh, anybody who wants to hang around for a little while, there's, I think, wine, and there's some punch, and some cheese, and crackers, and we can lose. Let me move this out of the way. Um, what is the model on that? Photographic John what's that, Day what's the name of this bought camera? with his the Sony house, what? which was Jillian's house. Sony Handicap. And yeah, what a number. number. He sold the house. And uh, so this one, you can talk to him. Mm. And, uh, After it's done. He's like a tracer. Okay, 4K. Where is it? Probably know? take something like that. Where is this taken? This is in Japan. Japanese made this is the color of the Yeah, that's the Thank you so much.